Hi, everyone. Today I will give a talk about the simulation evaluation of training implementations for the RISC-5 vector extension. At the first, we, I want to introduce the RISC-5 vector extension. RISC-5 vector extension is an instruction set which exploits the data level parallelism in a program. If you launch, if you issue a single vector instruction, a single vector instruction can launch several data operations at a time. And the RISC-5 vector extension is a more scalable single instruction multiple data architecture. And if you want to change your number of execution lengths or register vector register file size in your microarchitecture, you don't need to change your ISA. And so the RISC 5 vector extension can scale well from the microprocessor to the supercomputer. And the RISC 5 vector extension follows the vector less agnostic architecture, which means the programmer or the compiler doesn't need to know the vector length at a static time. So after the code is compiled and vectorized, it could run in any implementation with different vector lengths. The VLA architecture also enables CPU architects to build implementations with longer vector lengths. So we can see the VLA architecture decouples the ISA from the implementation not like the x86, SSE, and AVX. When they want to change the vector rate size, it, it, they publish the new vector ISA. And we can also see there is a recent trend towards a longer vector rate size, like Intel offers the AVX 512 and the ARM SV, whose register size can be up to the 2048 bit. So the VLA architecture can can let us, our vector lengths can be long, yet the number of execution lengths could be much small. Therefore, a uh, vector instruction may take multiple or even many cycles to complete. The figure is the example. The, the x1 is related to the function unit latency, and the y is related to the vector length divided by the number of execution lengths. The code sequence on the left side is, there. there you can see the vector A depends on the vector multiply and the vector shift depends on the vector A. And in this situation, v A, v vector A must wait the vector multiply complete, the, the vector A instruction can be issued. But I have to say first, if there are, there are no dependency between these instructions, they can be issued in every cycle. But there are data dependency in this instruction, so the vector, vector A cannot be issued until the vector multiply complete. Here is why, here is the motivation we do the training mechanism. That's because training mechanism is used to allow the dependent vector instructions to start execution as soon as possible. If we can let the partial result of the vector function can be forwarded to the next dependent vector function, vector instruction. Actually, the next vector instruction can be issued early. For example, uh, this is the same code sequence as the previous slide, and uh, on the right side, we, we use the training mechanism. So we can see after the first result of the vector multiply is completed, which is at cycle x1 plus one. And actually, we can issue the, the vector add instruction at this cycle because the result can be forwarded from the vector multiply to the vector add. So we can issue the vector add instruction early. And in the following example, we can assume that the x of i is three and the y of i is four for all of i. And the implementation with training takes 15 cycles. And the implementation with all the training takes 21 cycles. And that is 40% speed up. So we have just talked about the training mechanism. Let's talk about how we implement our vector microarchitecture. So as we just said, the uh, vector instruction will take multiple cycles. So we need a unit to spill the vector instruction into several operations to e execute. So we'll, that's what VLP does. VLP produces many operations according to the vector instruction and the current vector length. For example, an implementation with the vector razor size 
512 bits and 264 bits execution length. It means the VOP will produce the four operations for this vector instruction. The second one is vector function unit. The vector function unit is responsible for executing the operations dispatched by the VOP. And the number of execution lengths inside the vector function unit will be a parameterized feature in our simulation. We will, we will explore the impact of the number of execution lengths on the chaining in the following slides. Before the chaining is implemented, we need to, the, we need to implement a forwarding pass inside the vector unit so that we can forward the, the partial results from the vector function unit to the, another vector function unit. We assume full forwarding path in our simulation, so, which means any result of the vector function unit can be forwarded to any other vector function unit. And here is an example to show how the chaining works on our vector macro architecture. And on the left side, you can see the uh, vector multiply instruction are, is depend on the vector A instruction. And on the right side, you can see the uh, configurations with the vector register size 138 bits and the vector execution capability 64 bits. And the 64 bits is, which means uh, we can do the 64 bits of data at a time. So the VOP will produce two operations for one vector instruction. So, at this cycle, the first operation of the vector add will produce at the vector read stage. And the next cycle, the second operation is produced and the first operation is pushed to the execution stage. And the next cycle, we know the, the first operation of vector add will complete in this cycle. So actually we can issue the first operation of the vector multiply operation in this cycle, because in the next cycle, the result of the vector i will be forwarded to the vector multiply instruction. And so as the second operation of the vector multiply and vector multi add. In this cycle, we can see all of the data of the vector add are all forwarded to the vector multiply instruction, and this is how training works on our vector macro architecture. We classify our training into two implementations. The first one is the vector function unit chaining. We just talked about that. And the second one is memory chaining. In addition to the vector function unit chaining, create, super, create vector supercomputers such as the Cray1, Cray XMP, and Cray YMP. They support memory chaining. So with two, two chaining implementations, we consider two chaining scenarios in our simulation. The first one is restrict, restrict chaining, which only supports vector function unit chaining. And the second one is full chaining, which supports both vector function unit chaining and memory chaining. But why do we, spe why we need specially talking about the memory chaining? That's because in the past, it is easy for Cray supercomputer to do the memory chaining because they do not have the data cache and the virtual memory. Unfortunately, data cache and the virtual memory are commonplace in modern microprocessors. So here are some challenges to implement memory chaining in the cache-based processors. The first one is compared to the vector function in chaining, the computation time of vector load instruction is non-deterministic. And the cache misses and the TLB misses which may happen within a vector instruction and they are difficult to handle. And the last one is additional hardware resources are needed to check many outstanding memory assets induced by the vector instruction because our vector load instruction will produce many vector load operations. Before introducing our memory training implementation, we, I want to introduce the memory unit first. The scatter and vector memory instruction will use the same memory unit, but when the vector load instruction is issued, the VOP will take over this memory unit and start to produce the vector load operation into the memory unit. Uh, so the scalar memory instruction cannot be issued until the VOP produces the complete vector instruction. We also implement, implement the unblocking cache in our memory unit. So we must look at the impact of the different miss status holding register which is MSHR resource, this resources. 
including the numbers of outstanding memory assets and the number of bus requests. And here is how we implement the, our memory training implementation. First, we add the data-ready bits in each vector register. For example, if the second operation of the vector load instruction complete, maybe he cache hit, it cache hit, he will mark the second data read bit of the V1 vector register. Mark the, this, the data read bit finished. And if there is some instruction depend on the vector load instruction, the VOP will help the instruction to monitor the corresponding the data read bit. If the data read bit is ready, the VLP will produce the operation. And, here is, and it is how we implement the memory training. Here is our overall microarchitecture. And uh, on the right side is our configuration we are going to evaluate, including the vector register size and the capability of vector unit and cache miss penalty and uh, the MSHR resource. And the benchmark we use is the matrix multiplication. And the matrix A we use whose size is 64 by 64, and the max B is six, whose size is 64 by 256. In the innermost loop, we multiply the scalar and the, in, the, in the matrix A and the vector in the matrix B. You, you can see the code. And in the innermost loop, we, can, we will accumulate this result in the register, which store the partial sum. And after the innermost loop ends, the, in the outer loop, we will store back, store the, the partial sum back to the corresponding address of matrix C. Here's our performance evaluation. Based on the um, optimized code, and first we use the restrict training to do evaluation. Vector function unit training can give us at least 50% performance improvement. And we can see the impact of training become greater when the vector rate size is longer. What is interesting is we do not need to change the implementation. We can get this benefit under the risk 5 vector ex extension because risk 5 vector extension offers us the register grouping feature. So we can use this feature to boost our vector rate size from 500 bits to the 4,000 bits. And we can naturally get the, up to the 59% performance improvement. And the next is full training, and also based on the um, optimized code. Full training gives us at least 30% fuller performance improvement. And if your vector, registers, vector, register, vector register are grouped, which is offered by risk five vector ex extension, full training can give us up to the 69% performance improvement. And we start to explore the impact of the different vector execution capabilities. And we can clear, see clearly in, the, in this graph, when the vector execution capability is smaller, is weaker, the impact of training is greater. And it actually can be explained, explained by the following example. The example has a vector multiply instruction and a vector add instruction and a vector add instruction depend on the vector multiply instruction. And the execution time will be the x1 plus the x2 plus y2 plus 1. So if we, if we, make, if we use the weaker vector execution capability, your y will become longer because you need to produce many uh, many operations to, to use the weaker vector execution capability. So it will give more greater impact on the execution time. In the next one, we explore the impact of different cache miss penalties on the training. And we can see that when the miss penalty is smaller, the impact of training, training is greater. And it is also can be explained by the following example. If the code sequence have the vector load and the vector add, and vector add depend on the vector load, the execution, the execution time will be the x plus, x1 plus memory latency plus x2 plus y2 plus 1. When, so when our memory latency is small, 
we change our vector register size will have a greater impact on the execution time. The caveat is we do not have to code optimization on the previous experiment. So we start consider the code optimization on the non-training mechanism and non-training implementation and the training implementation. And the first one is non-training implementation. Actually, non-training implementation is not bad if your loop body is large enough. But, but our loop body is small, so we have to figure out how to, do, how to reserve that. So we can do the loop unrolling or the loop fusion to make the loop body more bigger and use the code scheduling or the software pipeline to schedule the code. And in this example, we, have, we use the software pipeline to get the two chime inside the innermost loop. And the vector instruction inside the chime can be executed on the, at the same time, which can, be, which can reduce the impact of delay issuing of the vector instruction in the no training implementation. We also optimize the code for the training implementation, but you need notice that the training implementation favors scheduling data dependent instruction together. For example, in this example, vector A is dependent on the vector multiply, so you had better schedule these two instructions together so you can get better performance improvement. After the code optimization on the training implementation and no training implementation. So we can see the training, the code implementation Code optimization can help the no training implementation to catch up the performance of performance gap with training until the 1024 bits. But why 1024 bits? That's because we only unrolling the loops with the unrolling factor of two. If you want to get up, get, catch up the performance gap on the vector rate size 2048 bits or the 4000. 96 bits, you need a bigger unrolling factor. But not all loops can be optimized this way because your inner loops, inner most loop iteration might not be so large to do so many unrolling. Previous experiments are based on the ideal scenario, scenario with sufficient MSHR resources. And we can see the left side is the performance of the optimized code. And we can see the performance may be bounded by the MSHR resources. And the impact of MSHR resources have greater impact on the optimized code, but less, less on the unoptimized code. Full or restrict training can help speeding up the unoptimized code. And the training is more effective when your factor register is longer only if your code has enough data parity. And the second one is code optimizations allow the implementation without training to catch up the implementation with training. However, the, the averaging vector length in the real application is about 100 to 200. It may not get full benefit of unrolling or the software pipeline, especially when the vector rate size is longer. However, the full or restrict training can naturally speed up the general loops and fuller performance gain can be obtained by additional up code optimizations. And for the cost effective vector microarchitecture, your design must consider the following factors. The first is MSHR resource and cache miss penalty and the number of cache pods. If your program are bounded by the memory bandwidth, you might need another cache pod. The second one is vector rate size and the execution capability of vector function unit. And the last one is effective code optimizations because not all the loops can be optimized to overcome the lack of training. And here's our reference. Thanks for your attention.